Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, building their case. Prosecutors in the trial of Derek Chauvin are now focusing their efforts to convict the former police officer with testimonies from his former colleagues. So once the subject is handcuffed and compliant or not resisting, is the officer to remove their knee? That would be an inappropriate time. We'll bring you more from the MPD lieutenant in charge of use of force instruction at the time of George Floyd's arrest and preview what's to come this morning. Critical condition, a Navy sailor remains in the hospital this morning after being shot by a hospital corpsman at a base in Maryland. The suspected gunman was killed by police. We'll tell you how the situation unfolded and what the Navy is now saying about the alleged shooter. Fashionably early, President Biden has announced that all American adults will be eligible for a vaccine by April 19th, almost two weeks earlier than his original deadline. How the administration is looking to pull off the task as the U.S. reaches yet another promising vaccine milestone. And on the move, the pandemic has fostered a hiring boom among America's top retail companies. Walmart, Target, and of course, Amazon have hired scores of warehouse workers to get your deliveries out on time. But what does the future hold for these workers and do the economic benefits outweigh the ever increasing on the job stresses? I am actually always amazed at how fast some of those packages come, and it's thanks to those workers. It is amazing. We needed it during <laughs> we this time. <laughs> yeah, we certainly could when we were stuck at home. We'll get to that a little bit later this week as part of our series, American Workers. But we begin with the major progress the U.S. is making in the coronavirus vaccine rollout. Today, the country will have a quarter of the adult vac- population fully vaccinated. Right now, 24.4 percent of all American adults are fully vaccinated. That's nearly 63 million people. And when you look at the total population, which includes 60 and 17 year olds, nearly a fifth of that broader age group has now received the second dose of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine or the one dose Johnson and Johnson shot. The progress comes as President Biden announces all adults should be eligible for the vaccine on April 19th. Hawaii is the only state that has not yet officially announced that it will meet that deadline. NBC News Now correspondent Dasha Burns is following the latest on the pandemic this morning. So, Dasha, older children may soon be able to get the vaccine. Pfizer is planning to submit its data on children ages 12 to 15 to the FDA soon. What happens from there? Hey, Joe, good morning. That's right. Pfizer about to submit its data to the FDA for those 12 and up right now. Only those 16 and up are eligible to be vaccinated. But in its trial, Pfizer said that the uh, vaccine had 100 percent efficacy in adolescents age 12 to 15. Now, Joe, the timing here could be really significant because this means it's possible that middle school students might be able to get the vaccine before school starts back up in the fall. The trial had about 2,200 participants. Side effects were similar to those of what we've seen in adults. But interestingly, the antibody response in this group was uh, even greater than what a previous trial showed in ages uh, 16 to 25, Joe. Now, with vaccination speeding up, many are still concerned about another wave. According to Johns Hopkins University, 44 percent of the country's new cases are coming from just five states. Now, I know opinions vary here, but do health experts believe we are at the start of another wave? Yeah, those five states, New York, Michigan, Florida, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. This is also a critical time as states are ramping up vaccination to try to avoid uh, this kind of surge. I want you to hear from Dr. Anthony Fauci on this. Listen. We're really on the brink of a surge. That's why I mean, it's really a critical time right now because we could just as easily swing up into a surge. That would be a setback for public health, but that would be a psychological setback too, because people are really have what we call COVID-19 fatigue. And we just don't want to have to go back to really shutting things down. According to data compiled by Johns Hopkins, the U.S. had more than 400,000 COVID cases in just the last week, Joe. Dasha, cases and hospitalizations are down in California, which was the nation's epicenter not too long ago. Governor Newsom has announced a plan to lift all COVID restrictions this summer if the numbers stay low. How would that work? Yeah, Joe, June 15th, that is the date California is targeting for lifting restrictions if numbers stay low and if there is enough 
supply of the vaccine to vaccinate all of its population. That means that movie theaters, bars, restaurants, churches, concert venues could all operate without strict capacity limits. The uh, average day, uh, cases per week has been about 2,700 or per day, rather. Uh, and uh, if those numbers remain, then they are looking at that June 15th date, Joe. All right, Dasha Burns, thank you so much. As we mentioned, President Biden has once again moved up the deadline for when all Americans can expect to be eligible for vaccination. Many states have already opened up to all adults. But beginning April 19th, every adult in every state, every adult in this country is eligible to get in line to get a COVID vaccination. NBCnews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece joins us now. Shannon, good morning. Now, many states have already opened up eligibility to those that are 16 and over. But what did the White House say about how states will be able to meet demand for those vaccinations? Because even if you're eligible, it's still hard for there to be supply and also, of course, to get an appointment. One of the toughest parts of this process. Yeah, absolutely. And that ability to get an appointment is really starting to vary state by state. You know, just as we kind of look at some general data about where you can get a CVS appointment in Michigan, but you can't get one in another state, for example. Uh, So the administration has continued to say that by the end of May, they should have enough doses for all Americans. So just because you may be eligible in mid-April under this sort of expanded eligibility guidelines that states and the administration has been pushing for, doesn't mean you're going to be able to get a vaccine. The administration is still dealing with some spotty vaccine production from J&J as it ramps up. For example, this week, about 15 percent fewer doses of the vaccine are going to go out compared to a week before. But the administration says J&J is still on track to meet their goal of 24 million doses by the end of April. And, you know, there's another question out there that we have been pressing them on. These states seeing surges. Are you going to get more vaccine there? And so far, we're not seeing the administration is sending redistributing vaccines at all to some of these places that are getting hardest hit right now. Now, Shannon, of course, the next thing that everybody wonders about once they get their vaccine is what does that mean I'm able to do now? Where can I go? Can I travel? We're watching these vaccine passports sort of be piloted elsewhere. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki was asked about those yesterday. What did she say about where the Biden administration stands on it? It was a pretty firm no as to whether or not the federal government is going to be the one issuing some sort of vaccine passport and collecting data on people's vaccine status. Here's what she had to say yesterday. The government is not now, nor will we be supporting a system that requires Americans to carry a credential. Uh, There will be no federal vaccinations database and no federal mandate requiring everyone to obtain a single vaccination credential. As these tools are being considered by the private and nonprofit sectors, our interest is very simple from the federal government, which is Americans' privacy and rights should be protected and so, the, so that these systems are not used against people unfairly. So, again, something we could see private companies, maybe individual companies doing, but not something that's going to be spearheaded by the federal government. Shannon, let's switch gears here. I want to ask you about the announcement from the Department of Education that it will hold a hearing on Title IX. We know the Biden administration is preparing to overhaul that regulation on how schools handle sexual misconduct cases. What will the hearing look like? Well, so this is really the first step in the Biden administration's efforts to rewrite rules that were put in place by the Trump administration that outline how public universities that receive government funding should handle sexual misconduct, sexual sexual assault allegations. Um, There is going to be a hearing. They are looking to hear from a lot of different parties, uh, get some input. It's really the first step, though, in then rewriting and revising those rules. There was a lot of criticism that the Trump administration's rules gave too much leeway to to accusers and not enough uh, support to victims. All right, Shannon, thank you so much. Day eight of the murder trial for Derek Chauvin is set to begin this morning as prosecutors focus on police policies and training when it comes to use of force. Three Minneapolis police officers took the stand yesterday to testify against their former colleague. Each witness was asked about the neck restraint used by Chauvin on George Floyd before Floyd died last May. Also on the stand, an outside expert with the Los Angeles Police Department who was asked to review the case. 
What is your opinion as to the degree of force used by the defendant on Mr. Floyd on the date in question? Uh, my opinion was that the force was excessive. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster has been following the trial for us from the beginning. He joins us now from Minneapolis. So, Shaq, the main point of contention in this case, at least right now, is that neck restraint and examining when officers exercise use of force and how they use it. So what were the main arguments made yesterday by both the prosecution and the defense? Well, this is the prosecution trying to show that the actions that you saw Derek Chauvin take when he restrained George Floyd and stayed uh, on him using his knee, uh, that that was not in compliance with uh, Minneapolis Police Department policy. They're trying to say that based on the training received uh, by the crisis intervention expert, based on the training received by the use of force lieutenant, and based on the training that uh, is received on CPR and the medical aid required for people in their care and custody, that what you saw Derek Chauvin do did not comply with that training. But there is some nuance here, and that's what the defense was trying to bring up in some of their cross-examinations. You heard the defense ask about the crowd of bystanders, for example, when talking to the officer uh, who trains on CPR, saying that when you have a crowd of people there, uh, possibly hostile, that that can uh, impede the process of providing CPR, for example, or make an officer hesitate before doing that. You heard them also mention the idea of... um, of resistance, the uh, neck restraints that are used. Neck restraints are part of Minneapolis Police Department policy. They're taught to officers, but they're not supposed to be down for a long time. They're not a, intended to be a hold, for example. So you heard the defense make some points as they were cross-examining some of their witnesses. You know, the defense is not presenting their case right now. They're not examining their witnesses yet, but they're trying to score some points as the prosecution continues to lay out its case and as the prosecution suggests that Derek Chauvin did not comply with the police department's policies and procedures. Joe? Shaq, looking forward, a potentially key witness for the defense is still up in the air. Can you tell us who is this person and why might we never hear from them? This is Maurice Hall. This is the passenger who is in the vehicle, that uh, SUV or minivan uh, with George Floyd when the police interaction first began. And uh, he was Uh, It it signaled, at least, that he will be a key witness for the defense. They mentioned him by name in their opening statements. Well, uh, Maurice Hall and his attorney uh, actually filed a motion earlier this week with the court saying that if he were to be compelled to testify, he would invoke his Fifth Amendment protections uh, so he doesn't incriminate himself. Uh, At issue here is the defense is saying that it was the drugs provided by Mr. Hall that led to George Floyd's death. His attorneys are saying if that's the case then he can have some liability and face some criminal liability uh, if he takes a stand and there's a potential that he will self-incriminate. So because of that, the judge is saying, bottom line, they're going to provide a list of questions that the defense wants to ask Mr. Hall. Um, Both the prosecution and Mr. Hall's attorneys will go through and agree on that list of questions before determining whether or not he actually comes and testifies. And finally, Shaq, we are midway through week two. What can we expect from court today? Well, we know that that expert, the outside uh, use of force expert from the Los Angeles Police Department, will come and continue his testimony. His testimony ended somewhat abruptly yesterday uh, after a sidebar of one of those private conversations between the attorneys and the judge. So he will take the stand. What we heard from him yesterday is he said that the use of force that we saw from Derek Chauvin was excessive. This is someone who studies this, who Uh, trains other officers on use of force techniques. And he says in his review of the entire situation, he believed what he saw was excessive. So we'll continue to hear testimony from him. We also may hear a ruling from a judge uh, regarding some uh, video um, that the defense is trying to admit. Uh, Some of those pre-trial, pre-testimony motions that we go through, uh, the judge may render his ruling on one of those decisions uh, this morning. Of course, the prosecution doesn't list specifically who they'll call to the stand. So outside of the testimony that we know needs to be completed, it's not clear exactly who specifically we'll hear from once court resumes later this morning, Joe. We'll wait and see who it is. Jack Brewster, thanks so much. A Navy hospital corpsman was killed by police at a military base in Maryland shortly after the corpsman shot two sailors nearby. NBC News global security reporter Dan DeLuce joins us now. Dan, first, let's just start with what happened. How did this shooting unfold yesterday? 
Thank you. So the, the gunman went to a office park in Frederick, Maryland, where there is a military facility, and he uh, shot two sailors there uh, who were both wounded. And then he got in the car and drove about 10 minutes down the road to Fort Detrick Army Base, where he was stationed. And uh, by then, the security guards there had gotten an alert uh, identifying a suspect, uh, possibly coming to be on the lookout for a suspect. Uh, when they tried to stop him, he drove ahead half a mile into the base at a parking lot where they then pursued him. And he got out of the car brandishing a weapon, and he was then shot and uh, soon after pronounced dead. So the gunman was killed. He was a Navy medic stationed at that base. And then the two suspects, uh, then the two victims uh, survived the shooting. So, Dan, where does the investigation stand this morning? You just mentioned he's a Navy medic. Do we know anything else about the shooter? We really don't. They identified him. his name, Fanta Hune Walderson, that, uh, that he was uh, 38 years old, uh, that he was a medic. But, you know, whether he knew the victims, uh, why he might have chosen to do this, what his mental health state was at that time, these are all unanswered questions. Uh, the, the military and the local police are all looking into this, as well as the FBI. And I think there's still a lot of questions to be answered as to how this could have happened. You know, that base is a really sensitive place. The very important uh, biological defense research that's done there, a lot of scientists who work there, it's the military's premier sort of a civilian biological defense research center. And Dan, you mentioned, thankfully, the two victims did survive. I know yesterday we were reporting that they were in critical condition. Do we know how they're doing? One of the victims is now uh, improved, and they expect uh, that victim to be released today from hospital. So that was some good news. The mm -hmm. other shooting victim is still in critical condition. All right. Dan Deleuze, thank you so much for the updates here. Thank you. Time to get a check on our international headlines. Janice Mackey Freyer joins us this morning from Beijing. Hey there. Hey, good morning. Well, it seems there's another possible setback for AstraZeneca. Scientists at the University of Oxford who've been trying to devise a COVID vaccine for kids have said that there is a pause in the child clinical trial for AstraZeneca. Apparently the company wants more data on whether the vaccine could be causing some issues with blood clotting. This is something we already know that that has affected the rollout of vaccine doses to certain age groups. This clinical trial involved teenagers and children. Vaccinating these age groups is seen as crucial to ending the pandemic. So this is seen as another setback for AstraZeneca. Moving now to Myanmar, where the situation continues to deteriorate with more violence, the country veering dangerously towards civil war. Pro-democracy groups are urging global pressure on the military regime there to stop the crackdown that has intensified against protesters uh, since the coup in February. More than 500 people have been killed, dozens of them children, more than 2,600 people have been detained. The UN Special Envoy to Myanmar has warned, quote, a bloodbath is imminent. And lastly, Royals watching of a different sort, as Prince Harry and Meghan have announced their first project for Netflix. It's going to focus on athletes competing in the Invictus Games in The Hague in 2022. Harry will appear in it. He will also serve as executive producer for the series called Heart of Invictus. It will give viewers a behind the scenes look at how these athletes who are injured military veterans are training and preparing for the games. They're gonna be held in the spring. They were, of course, delayed because of the pandemic. So there will be lots of extra eyes on this project, uh, <laughs> given who is involved. Guys, back to you. One of many, many projects for them right yeah, now. Absolutely. They are busy. <laughs> lots going on, yeah. Be cool to see. Thanks, Janice. Let's get a check on your morning news now. Weather? Bill Karens is with us. Hi, Bill, good morning. 
Hey, good morning. I I know you guys are enjoying the San Diego weather that's on, you know, been with us on the East Coast for the last couple of days. <laughs> it continues, guys. I think we're going to see a nice stretch continuing maybe through Saturday for the Eastern Seaboard because all the troublesome weather is in the middle of the country. And that's where we start this morning. We had severe weather yesterday in areas of Kansas. And now our big storm is continuing to roll through areas of the Midwest and through the Northern Plains. You know, there's a big batch of rain and thunderstorms exiting Kansas City now in central Missouri. Another Another batch of heavy rain in there along the border of South Dakota and Minnesota. And yes, that blue on the map is snow this morning on the border of Colorado and Kansas. It can snow even in April. As far as severe weather goes, this is the big story today. We could see a possible a tornado or two. That area of orange is especially at risk. If you have any friends in Little Rock to Memphis, the Greenville, Mississippi, northern Louisiana, those are the people that need to know that they have a risk of severe weather, possible tornadoes today. We could also get large hail and, of course, damaging winds with those storms. And the stormy weather is going to remain in those same areas. So today we deal with the threat of, obviously, severe weather and the fear of tornadoes. But over the next couple of days, we're going to get a bunch of rain, and we could deal with some flooding problems there throughout areas of Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, maybe Tennessee and Alabama. I mentioned the great, you know, quote unquote, San Diego weather. D.C. today, 79 degrees. New York City around 68, a good deal of sunshine early. No problems on the West Coast. Look at how warm we get tomorrow. That little bit of pink you see on the map below San Antonio could be 100 degrees in South Texas tomorrow. That would be the first hundreds of the season in areas of the U.S. So that'll be a story to watch. But, uh, you know, we don't get a lot of great stretches of weather. We don't like to focus just on the northeast but we don't get a lot of great stretches of weather this has to be one of the best we've mm. seen in a long time that is true and as a san diegan bill i can confirm this feels familiar in the best way so thanks so much <laughs> nice <laughs> see you in a bit we have a pool party <laughs> Coming up with Michigan in the red yet again when it comes to COVID cases, officials are now focusing on getting young people vaccinated. How the state's governor is now helping with that push up next. In the news this Wednesday morning, the L.A. County Sheriff is expected to release a report today on the car crash that severely injured golf legend Tiger Woods. Officials say it will not reveal details about the cause of the accident. Woods injured his right leg in the crash and had surgery in California to stabilize ankle and foot injuries. He returned home to Florida last month to recover. One Kardashian is keeping up with the billionaires like Elon <laughs> Musk and Bill Gates. Forbes has decreed that Kim Kardashian is now worth one billion dollars. That's up from only seven hundred eighty <laughs> million dollars back in October. Her bank accounts were largely boosted by two of her businesses, KKW Beauty and Skims Shapewear. And Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers has started his stint as guest host of Jeopardy. During final Jeopardy, a contestant who clearly did not know the answer used the opportunity to ask the NFL MVP about a controversial decision made by the Packers during last season's NFC Championship game. Scott, did you come up with the correct response? Who wanted to kick that field goal? <laughs> That is a great question. Contestant Scott Schufelt was referring to when the Packers decided to kick a field goal rather than go for a touchdown while trailing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers by eight points, a decision that ultimately ended the Packers season. Rodgers will continue to host Jeopardy for the next two weeks. I actually haven't caught these new episodes this week yet. We're still on the Dr. Oz episodes. So. Is, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, because you, you guys record them, right? Yeah. Um, it, it is fun. Of course, we all miss Alex, but it is cool seeing these guest hosts and how they all put their own little spin on it and their tributes to him. It's really neat. They're all doing a great job because I cannot imagine it's easy. Absolutely, especially filling the shoes of a legend. All right, thanks, Joe. Now, on the COVID front, tens of millions of Americans are getting vaccinated. But for the state of Michigan, it can't happen fast enough. In the state, it appears that young people are driving the latest spike in cases. Governor Gretchen Whitmer and her 19-year-old daughter joined a group of teen ambassadors yesterday to publicly get their shots in an effort to inspire young people to get theirs. NBC News Now correspondent Priscilla Thompson joins us from Motor City. Hey, Priscilla, good morning. Now, the mantra we've heard from public health leaders, governors, even the president is something along the lines of get the shot as soon as it's your turn. While in Michigan, if you're over 16, it is your turn. Can you tell us more about why the governor did this yesterday with these teens? 
Uh, good morning, Savannah. Well, to understand why the governor is doing this, it's important to look at those numbers that are coming out from the state. When they look at their data, stu- uh, children aged 10 to 19 are seeing a spikes of around 230 percent when it comes to daily new COVID cases. They are uh, the leading group in Michigan when it comes to new cases. And so there's no question among state officials that this is driving the spike in hospitalizations that they're seeing across the state. In fact, 40 percent of the new outbreaks are coming from clusters at schools and youth sports. And of course, If a student contracts the virus, they are going home to older adults like parents and other people in the community, and it is really causing that community spread. And so that's why we saw Governor Whitmer here at Ford Field getting that shot alongside her daughter yesterday. And she also had a message for other parents in Michigan. Take a listen to what she said. My fellow parents across the state, I encourage you to bring your high schoolers or college age students with you, like I did today, um, to get vaccinated, especially if they are in that 16 to 17 year old range. Because we know what the spread looks like right now. And it's really crucial that as parents, we not just model, but we help our kids to, to be safe as well. And Savannah, some good news here. It does appear that the two-week average is going down very slowly, but still over 100% increase. So a long way to go here. Savannah. Now, Priscilla, the Ford Field and FEMA mobile site have administered over 66,000 doses as of Sunday. Tell us some specifics behind those numbers and how the community there has been served. Are those who really need this shot getting it? Uh, Well, so this site was set up a little over a week ago, and it was designed to really get to uh, low-income communities and uh, the minority population here in Detroit. But we just got new data from the state a few hours ago, and I want to actually show you what these numbers are actually looking like. So here in Detroit, this is a city that is 80 percent black, but only 9.5 percent of people have black people have gotten vaccines at this mass Uh, vaccination site. And you compare that to white uh, residents who make up 15 percent of the population in Detroit, but account for 57.6 percent of all vaccination vaccinations at this site. And you're seeing there is a pretty significant disparity there. And what community leaders have said is that there are folks who are coming in from the suburbs outside of the city in order to get those vaccines here, and that it may not be actually serving the Detroit community that it was initially intended to serve. So Priscilla, just quickly, do we know what they're going to do to try to fix that, to get those who need the shot there the shot? Yeah, well, officials have told us that this mass site isn't the only place for people to get vaccines. So the city of Detroit uh, and other local uh, organizations have community health clinics. There are local pharmacies that people can go to. The city has also set up some walk-in clinics, again, to break down some of those barriers to access. And so they are hopeful that they can close uh, those disparity gaps. Savannah. All right, Priscilla, thank you so much. New Jersey has lifted some of its pandemic restrictions, even though coronavirus hospitalizations there were up almost 20 percent in March. The state hopes to calm the spike in cases when vaccine appointments open up to everyone 16 and older on April 19th. NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt spoke with Governor Phil Murphy on his fight to keep the virus in check. Hi, Joe in Savannah. New Jersey is one of the states struggling with rising COVID cases, second only to Michigan and the rate of infections. In an NBC News exclusive, I spoke to New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy about what's happening there and why. 17 different places in Newark right now. And that's- I met up with New Jersey's governor as he visited a FEMA vaccination site in Newark. Is this number one? Huh? Is yes, this first? Number one. one of the battlegrounds in the state's urgent fight to reverse an increase in COVID infections. Yeah, we rank highly, unfortunately. Densest state in America, densest region in America, a cold weather winter state, multi generational families. Are you in a, a new wave right now? I think we are uh, in a plateau. Uh, We're up somewhat over the past 
couple of weeks, but still down meaningfully from where we were in January. Over the last 13 days, New Jersey has a nearly 13 percent increase in cases. Hit hard at the start of the pandemic, New Jersey under Governor Phil Murphy already has the highest COVID death toll per capita. Over 24,000 New Jerseyans have died, another 15 just yesterday. If this was happening at the beginning of the pandemic, You'd likely be adding restrictions, not not reducing them. Is that a fair statement? Well, certainly at the time we did a year ago, and, 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 and that had a lot to do with the fact that none of us knew what hit us. I think you've got variants in our state. We're not really doing a whole lot of opening. New Jersey recently eased capacity restrictions for indoor dining, entertainment venues, gyms, among others, but has moved more cautiously than many other states. Are the decisions now in terms of allowing you know, half capacity in restaurants, for example, are those science based or based on pressure from restaurant owners? Now, we I mean, we have nothing but sympathy for the restaurant industry as an example, which has been completely clobbered. Uh, but we're still making the decisions based on the data. There have been some states that have largely thrown away, uh, lifted all their restrictions and are doing better than New Jersey. Does that frustrate you? I think it's because of less density and warmer weather, honestly. They're able to spread out more than we can, and they're able to live more of their lives outdoors than we can. It's a reason for us to remain sober and, and to double down on our efforts, and we'll continue to do that. The state working to head off what models project is a worst case. Worst case is four or 5,000 folks in the hospital. Our peak in the spring last year was just under 8,300. New Jersey has administered more than 4.7 million vaccine doses, but has been slower than many states in expanding eligibility. So you have, uh, New Jersey now has dropped the eligibility to age 55 and over, so as of yesterday, you qualify. I'm, I'm in. Governor Murphy does not foresee tightened restrictions in New Jersey's future. The bottom of his tool bag should cases continue to rise, maybe a plea from the heart. We know that you're fatigued. We know you're sick of this, but please, God, keep doing the basic stuff. Get vaccinated. Get tested if you need to be. In line with President Biden's new directive, Governor Murphy says New Jersey will open up vaccinations to all its residents over age 16 on April 19th. Joe and Savannah. Let's bring in Dr. Anand Swaminathan. He's an assistant professor of emergency medicine. Dr. Swaminathan, thank you for being here. We always love when you join us. Now, why do you think cases are still rising in states like New Jersey and many other states, even though more people are getting vaccinated every day? I think there's a number of different issues here. I think the variant is a big part of this. But I think beyond that is the easing of restrictions that we've seen over the last month or so that are taking place. And, you know, Governor Murphy said that we haven't added, but we have expanded indoor dining. We've expanded the number of people who are allowed to be in private groups and outdoor groups. And those are issues because, you know, Savannah, even if I got my first dose of vaccine today, it's five to six weeks before I actually have immunity to the virus. And in that five to six weeks, we need to be really embracing those public health restrictions while we're waiting for our second dose and a little bit of time afterwards. And that's not exactly what we're seeing here. We're getting this mixed message of get your vaccine, wear your mask, distance, but we're going to expand indoor dining. We're going to expand the amount of people that can gather. We're going to open uh, restaurants and movie theaters and gyms. And that's not what the public needs. The public needs a clear message. We are in a surge. The variants are moving fast. Our vaccines are starting to catch up. We need you to keep inside. We need to keep you in your in your bubbles that you're in and just stick it out a little bit longer. But that's not the message that we're getting. Mm, especially as people do have that COVID fatigue. Um, Dr. Nathan, there's a little bit of news about AstraZeneca's vaccine, which is that researchers at Oxford are pausing its vaccine study on kids while they wait for more data on the rare blood clotting issues that some adults who received the shot dealt with. Uh, that was in the European Union. I want to ask you, though, what this means for supply, because we heard Dr. Anthony Fauci tell Reuters that the U.S. may not actually need AstraZeneca's vaccine, even if it is eventually authorized by the FDA. And that's because of supplies and these contracts that we have with other vaccine makers. Do you think the U.S. has enough vaccines at its disposal to reach herd immunity? And does this mean that there is soon going to be a time that if you're eligible and you want an appointment, you can easily get one without refreshing 10 browsers and 10 different windows 100 times? 
That, I hope so. I, I hope that's what we're moving towards. And the AstraZeneca news is unfortunate because we do need to expand our testing within kids to find out if these vaccines are effective, if they're safe, because we need kids to be vaccinated in order to get to herd immunity. That's going to be really important. And we're talking about a, a small handful of these events, about 44, over 20 million people have received this vaccine in the EU. So I think it's a very small number. And the, the most that we've really heard is association between these clots and the vaccine. Association isn't causation. We need more data to really see that. What we know, though, is the AstraZeneca vaccine has saved tens of thousands of lives. Lives, what we're going to see in the U.S. is probably not needing AstraZeneca, but it's going to be important for us to approve and review that data because that's going to boost confidence around the world. And we mm. can't fight this pandemic unless we're getting vaccines around the world. That is a great point. It's not just about us here in the U.S. Dr. Swami Nathan, as always, thank you. Thank you, Savannah. Coming up after a tumultuous few days, now one Florida community can finally breathe a little easier. We've got the latest on that compromised wastewater reservoir and the cleanup that's now underway next. Election reform might be dividing the country right now, but in Kentucky, lawmakers have found common ground. Democratic Governor Andy Bashir is expected to sign the state's newest election reform bill into law today. It's a rare moment of bipartisanship for an issue that has become a national point of political contention. NBCNews.com senior political reporter Jane Tim joins us now. So, Jane, let's start with what's in this bill and how Kentucky's lawmakers satisfied both Republicans and Democrats here. Hey, Joe. Now, reading through the bill, what's clear is they put something in there for everyone. So it expands early voting, which is, of course, a big issue for Democrats, whereas um, other states are considering mail voting. They've added three days of early voting, Thursday, Friday and Saturday before an election. And it also adds an ability to cure absentee ballot mistakes, which is something Kentucky voters were able to do in the pandemic. And this makes it permanent. It creates an online portal for requesting mail ballots, and it allows Dropbox but you'll notice there's things in there for the Republicans, too. So those drop boxes, which are being eliminated around the country um, in some of these restrictive laws, they say, OK, you can use them, but it has to be in a well-lit area. And we're going to put it under video surveillance to keep things safe. So you're seeing that everyone gets to go home with something to their constituents. Ah, bipartisanship. What a, <laughs> what a refreshing thing to hear about. <laughs> Jane, let's look at the corporate pressure on the new restrictive voting laws in Georgia. Republican lawmakers are now criticizing Major League Baseball's decision to move the All-Star game from Georgia to Colorado. They're drawing a comparison between the two states' voter ID laws. Can you tell us more about those laws and are they similar or and how are they different? You know, the spirit of Colorado's elections could not be more different to Georgia's elections. Colorado's voter ID allows you to use a, uh, you know, a paycheck, uh, utility bill, the kind of things that you usually use to like get a library card. This is a, what we call a non-strict voter ID law, whereas Georgia has one of the strictest voter ID laws in the country where typically you're going to need a driver's license to vote. Colorado's laws are almost elections are run almost entirely by mail. Whereas Georgia is adding restrictions to how they vote by mail. These are very, very different states. And, and the argument that there's both voter ID is uh, pretty specious. Of course, every state's not like Colorado. Now, Jane, Republicans are also taking aim at voting laws in New York and New Jersey. Do those states deserve that kind of criticism? You know, it's funny. I, I called a couple of voting rights advocates about this, and they all kind of bristled at this, this comparison because they were like, yes, and New York. We also want to make changes to New York law. Um, if you voted in New York before, you know that we've had some historically some of the more regressive election laws. Um, New Yorkers have been lawmakers have been trying to make those laws better. We recently added early voting. Um, they're building an automatic voter registration in the state. So while the past criticism is probably fair and, and New York has had a history of discriminating against minority voters as well, it was also under Section 5 protection um, of the Voting Rights Act up until it was that was eliminated. So there's Comparisons here. This isn't a blue state, red state thing. This is a, a rights issue. All right, Jane Tim, thank you for breaking it down for us. We appreciate it. People living near a central Florida toxic wastewater reservoir are now allowed to return to their homes after being evacuated. Officials now say enough water has been drained out of the Piney Point Reservoir and there's no longer a threat of a collapse and flooding. 
Crews spent the past few days pumping out millions of gallons of the water after the pond breached over the weekend. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber joins me now from Palmetto, Florida. Ellison, this is good news, obviously, that it sounds like there's not going to be this total collapse. But what is the situation like now at the pond? Is there any further risk to residents? Yeah, so in terms of the immediate risk and the potential for catastrophic flooding, state and local officials say that they feel like that is not going to happen. The agriculture commissioner was in the area yesterday and she said the situation is under control, as under control as it can be. This is sort of a lesser of evil sort of situation. But in terms of the immediate goal they had of preventing a collapse of the reservoir that is filled with millions, hundreds of millions of gallons of wastewater to prevent a collapse of that and catastrophic flooding into nearby homes and businesses, they say like they feel like they have done that at this point. They have pumped over 100 million gallons of wastewater into the Manatee Port, which then leads into Tampa Bay. There are still about 300 million gallons of wastewater in that damaged, leaking reservoir. But they say they have the leak itself kind of fixed and and rerouted, if you will. And for now, for the most part, they're doing these controlled releases into Tampa Bay. Savannah. Yeah. So, Ellison, let's talk about the fact that this toxic wastewater is now in Tampa Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. What are the potential environmental impacts officials and scientists are looking out for? I mean, of course, it's what they had to do to keep humans safe, but it's kind of hard to imagine that toxic water is just being pumped straight into a bay. Right. Yeah. So it's not a great situation. And again, people have said this was really just the lesser of evils, but Mm. there could be a host of problems that come as a result of this. As a reminder, this wastewater is comprised of salt water that was put there after a dredging project a few years back. There's also rainfall because these reservoirs are open air, so they've been idled for years and rainwater storms and they come through, that's added to it. Then there's also wastewater that is a byproduct of this phosphate plant that used to manufacture fertilizer that water sits inside what is known as gypsum stacks and those stacks are radioactive they say this water is not radioactive but it has high levels of nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus that can lead to harmful algae blooms that can lead to fish kills dead zones it can contaminate shellfish then if it doesn't kill a bunch of fish little fish can eat that it can be toxic for them then it makes its way into the food chain it can Uh, These blooms, they can lower property value. They can cause harm to businesses, recreation activities, hurt the tourism industry. It kind of has a very big ripple effect if these nutrients lead to harmful algae blooms and things like red tide. Savannah? Yeah, wow. It's really just a huge mess. So now the cleanup begins. Mm -hmm. What are state leaders doing to keep this area safe and make sure this doesn't happen again? And and is there anything that's going to be done about all those potential issues with the food chain there, you said? Yeah, so the Department of Environmental Protection says they have 11 sites uh, in the port and then along the adjacent waterways where they are constantly testing this water. They say for now that it meets uh, the water quality standards for this area, but they are constantly checking this. State legislators actually are going to be considering a budget amendment and uh, talk about it. We're expecting them to talk about it and discuss it today to allocate uh, some $200 million in COVID relief fund from uh, the American Rescue Plan from the Biden administration to perhaps pay for and permanently idle and close and fill in these reservoirs. That's a very long project. And one thing they're considering potentially doing if they get the funds for it is uh, building what's known as a deep well where they go some 3,000 feet into the Mm. ground, treat this wastewater and then just inject it there. Savannah. All right, Ellison, lots to watch for there. Thank you so much. Coming up, Amazon has been on a hiring spree since the pandemic started, filling out its warehouses with workers to meet consumer demand. But what does the future hold for these blue collar workers and is unionization on the horizon? We'll dig deeper next. All this week, NBC News is featuring American workers whose jobs have been transformed by the pandemic. Today, we get a look inside an Amazon fulfillment center and what could be the blue collar job of the future, the warehouse worker. NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule joins us now with more. Hi, Stephanie. 
Hey there, guys. This week, we could see the result from a vote to form a union at one single Amazon warehouse down in Bessemer, Alabama. Why is there all this focus on one single facility? Because supercharged by the pandemic, Amazon and other major retailers have hired millions of people to make sure you receive your orders online and as quickly as possible. So the big question is, are all of these warehouse workers replacing manual labor, factory work and service jobs? Well, with steady pay and regular schedules, these could be the blue collar jobs of the future. Drive down the New Jersey Turnpike and you'll see the future of work for many Americans. Jobs in warehouses like this one for Amazon. We pick out the items that are ready to be shipped out for the customers that have ordered. Like hundreds of thousands of others, Carlos Linares started last summer after he was laid off from his hotel job because of the pandemic. Do you consider this a short-term job? At first, it was going to be a short-term job, but I have realized that I could actually have growth here. Emily Gramajo lost her job at a restaurant. A year later, she's a robotics tech. And I used to work six days, so I always was on my feet. If your old job called you today and said, come back, would you go back? I wouldn't. No. As a result of the pandemic, Americans stayed home and online shopping surged to more than 20 percent of retail sales. During the pandemic, were you supercharging your hiring or was it on pace? With that increased cost and demand, we were able to be a, a job provider. Jobs and warehouse centers grew by 10 percent last year. Amazon and companies like it employ millions of people in facilities like this across the country, and they're hiring more every day. In places like Riverside, California, Dallas, and Chicago, but also Atlanta, Columbus, and Phoenix, cities close to major highways, railroads, and ports. They employ a whole lot of people, and they pay a whole lot in taxes. So from an economic standpoint, they've been tremendous. And even as these e-commerce warehouses become more automated, it doesn't mean fewer jobs. It means that workers are having to speed up the pace at which they're working, their productivity levels. And this is where we, we run into problems with health and safety. And for some employees, Employees like Courtney Brown meeting this growing demand for online shopping can take a toll. It's getting to a point where it's just like, how much more can we do? She's been working at an Amazon warehouse for nearly four years. Would you say it's more stressful now than it was pre-pandemic two years ago? Way more stressful. Way more stressful. You're being hounded a lot more for everything. Being pressed to produce numbers and pretty much be close to perfect. So, Stephanie, what is Amazon saying about the concerns about worker health and safety and claims that employees are being overworked, the, the things that we've heard from people who want this union? Well, Amazon told us that it does prioritize the health and safety of their employees. They encourage them to work with managers to come up with ways to succeed at the company. But just think about this. At this facility, or the one I was at, employees work four days a week, 10 hours a day. In addition, they have two half-hour paid breaks. For many without a college degree or specialized training, these are jobs you can walk into, get hired, and you make $16.50 an hour plus benefits. However... They are really physical jobs. And as we demand overnight, even same day delivery, mm -hmm. more and more employees are worrying that they are feeling the pressure to work even harder. When your coworker is a robot, it's hard to keep up. That mm -hmm. is one of the main reasons we're hearing from Amazon workers in Alabama that they want to form a union um, because they want more support. Amazon doesn't support the union, but they say they look forward to feedback from their employees. They do want to make things better. So, Stephanie, if workers do unionize in Alabama, what could that mean for other Amazon facilities like the one you visited? Mm. It could be huge. That one facility in Alabama is only 6,000 employees. However, Amazon is so influential when they make any moves. Remember, when they raised wages, you saw other retailers, other big box stores with similar facilities have to do the same. Amazon alone has one million employees in every state. So we could see this one facility in Alabama suddenly be a daisy chain for more and more. If these are the factory jobs of the future, remember, the factory jobs of the past, those employees were union workers. Mm. That's a good point. Interesting to see what's going to happen. Stephanie, thank you so much. Great report.
Back on the COVID-19 front, the rate of vaccinations is increasing, but so is the rate of new cases in parts of the country. The unpredictable virus is now pitting some health experts against each other over whether the U.S. should anticipate yet another surge of the coronavirus. NBC News Now correspondent Maura Barrett has more. As France and Italy entered their third round of lockdowns this past weekend, the U.S. celebrating a record-breaking day of vaccinations, four million shots in one day. But the seven-day average for new cases is above where it was just two weeks ago, on the rise in more than 20 states, hitting more than 64,000 new cases a day. We do not have the luxury of inaction. For the health of our country, we must work together now to prevent a fourth surge. Over the last year, we watched as the U.S. mimicked trends that we saw in Europe. Now, experts are conflicted over whether this will happen again. We really are in a Category 5 hurricane status with regard to the rest of the world. In terms of the United States, we're just at the beginning of this surge. We haven't even really begun to see it yet. And we're now, I think, in that cycle where the upper Midwest is just now beginning to start this fourth surge. And I don't think it's going to be the start of a true fourth wave. I think that this is going to be regionalized outbreaks, and hopefully we get beyond this as we vaccinate more there clearly is an increase. The difference factor that's going on right now that we're different from the surges that we saw last year is that we have a highly efficacious vaccine now. So the real question is, is the efficacy of the vaccine going to prevent that from going up the way we saw it in previous surges? So is this the fourth wave of COVID-19 or isn't it? Let's take a look at how the numbers differ this time around. At first glance, it's not so good. We haven't seen cases increase from a low point since October. And daily new cases, while much lower than the last few months, is still around where it was during the peak of the wave in July. When you look closer, after months of decline, the drop in hospitalizations has plateaued and the death rate is down to the lowest level since October, but still more than 800 people a day. Those numbers usually lag behind the case numbers. The CDC points to peaks of new cases coming from largely younger people, pegging the spread to sports and extracurriculars. That's the same population that, until this week for many states, hasn't been eligible to receive vaccines. Increased eligibility and vaccine supply expected to ramp up, combated with loosened restrictions and lifting of mask mandates across the country, has President Biden warning that, fourth wave or not, the work still isn't done. I want every American to know in no uncertain terms that this fight isn't over. This progress we've worked so hard to achieve can be reversed. Now's not the time to let down. Now's not the time to celebrate. It's time to do what we do best as a country, do our duty, our jobs, take care of one another. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.